right, so I'm Nicole Becker, and we're going to talk about cyber insurance, right? This is like a little bit maybe unusual for an OWASP event, I'm not really that sure, but um, just a quick show of hands. Has anyone ever been involved in any cyber insurance anything in their entire careers? Okay, all right. Did it, was it a weird experience, a good experience? Anyone want to have a shout out opinion? All right. Somewhat for real. Yeah, all right. Got it. Okay, so let me just, all right. So who am I? I mean, you know, this is like kind of a boring slide, but basically the way this all started for me is I was working for a regulator and my boss at the time was like, hey, we got to figure out what's going on in cyber insurance. Can you do some research on this? And I had no idea what cyber insurance was. So I sort of went down this gigantic rabbit hole learning about how this insurance industry is working. And, you know, I'm sort of here to like show you that knowledge. Um, whatever. That's what all the other stuff I do. All right, so the motivation here is like, this insurance industry is growing pretty rapidly. I mean, if anybody works for any Fortune 100, Fortune 500, even Fortune 1000, like if you're a vendor to a Fortune 100 company, they're kind of requiring that you have cyber insurance right now. Like this is becoming a thing. Like people need to buy this stuff. So this industry is exploding. And it's like sort of touching on InfoSec. Like we are being asked to be involved in these discussions. People are asking us for information about what we know about our security posture so that they can give that to the underwriters. And I just think it will help us all if InfoSec knows a little bit more about how this industry is working. So the goal of this talk is to get everyone to feel more comfortable kind of speaking about this insurance world. All right. So what is insurance, right? I mean, insurance is pretty basic. We all interact with it all day long, right? We have car insurance, house, you know, homeowners insurance, you know, uh, health insurance, you know, but it's basically a mechanism to spread out risk so that, you know, there's like sort of a calculation here. It's not going to happen to everyone. It's only going to happen to some people. So you pull it all together and it sort of works out for, you know, the large swaths of the population, right? So just some terminology here. What is risk? Potential for a loss, right? Very clear. What's exposure? Someone or something that could experience damage, right? You know, something that could get hurt by the risk. Loss is the quantification of that exposure. And a claim is just a demand from one party to another to say, all right, this has happened to me. This insurance policy needs to respond to this. That's all a claim is. All right, so cyber insurance. So like, where, how did we get here, right? So it largely grew in the 1980s out of this thing called technology errors and omissions insurance. And errors and omissions, they call it E&O in the industry, is short for like, you know, something got messed up, right? There was an error, there was an omission, something got deleted, someone accidentally fat fingered something. Something happened that was unintentional, right? But things happen every day, right? Stuff happens. So, you know, this insurance policy grew out of like, technology can sort of get messed up and like, we need to ensure against that mess up. Then it starts growing. Around 2000, this Y2K stuff starts happening and then nothing happened. But it was designed to like fill the gaps between the traditional property and casualty insurance. So the way it works is like if you're a company, you got to buy this stuff called commercial insurance, right? And the property and casualty aspect of commercial insurance is where all this cyber stuff exists, right? So then 2000 to 2010, this is like the decade of like the big monumental data breaches. I mean, I think this decade is too, but that was the first decade that was like the big monumental data breach decade. So, you know, more regulation, there's fines, there's like, a, you know, compliance risk that happens. So, you know, it starts growing there. And cyber insurance products are trying to adapt to like the regulatory environment. Then in 2014, TJ Maxx goes through this like serious situation. You know, they had some clash action lawsuits that cost them $177 million. That was like getting to be like real money now. People were like, whoa, like we can be on the hook for like that much money in a class action lawsuit. Like we need some way to insure against this. And at the end of the day, you know, the predictions are that that breach cost them between one and four and a half billion dollars. It's a lot of money. All right, so then in 2017, 2018, 2019, that's so where we are now. Like, the insurance products are just like, there's a lot of them now. There's a variety of them. If you're a small 10 person law firm, you could buy something to cover your small 10 person law firm. If you're a Fortune 10 company, you could buy a complex variety of products to cover your Fortune you know, 10 company. All right. So I like history, and I think this is super interesting. Like, how did we get to like insurance, right? Like, what's the how did how, you know how, how how does this mechanism like what's the history here? So like, it's actually really interesting. Like back in the days of this Hammur of Hammurabi, right? Um, you know, shipping and merchant vessels were like the tech entrepreneurs of the day. You had a ship, you went out to sea, you know, you were collecting goods and great things from other areas of the globe. And so, you know, people would invest in you to try to see what your venture would net, right? And so what would happen is sometimes these ventures, the boat would sink, some, the pirates would come and steal all the goods, stuff happened, right? And like the people that invested in the, in the vessels were like, you still owe me this money. And like, it was like, well, something happened that I couldn't control, so like, how could I pay 
pay you? You know, like, what am I supposed to do? So basically, this, this was known as bottomry. And it basically became this idea that you could cancel the loan if the shipment is lost or stolen at sea. So it was like a, it was like a kind of like an insurance policy, right? Your ship gets stolen or sunk, and you're not on the hook for this kind of money that was invested in your shipping vessel. All right. <laughs> So then we get to like the guilds, right? We're just moving along here. And the guilds, you know, guilds were just blacksmiths, you know, sort of tradesmen of the time. And they established these like cohorts of people. And they, what they would do is if in the event of fire or like death or theft of all their property would happen, they would like self-insure each other. So the guild would sort of help you. If you got killed and your family needed to be supported, the guild would sort of pay for your family's like, you know, for the rest of their lives. And this became the idea of group coverage. And anybody who lives in America who has health insurance, you have group coverage, right? And this is how it started. You work for one company, you guys are a group. You move, you go work for another company, it's a new group, right? So you spread the risk around your group, right? I don't get this arrow key. All right, super other interesting story. So, you know, back to our shipping kind of or, or concept here, right? Like, the, as these vessels were being sort of understood and like people were investing in these shipping vessels, what would happen is people would, you know, kind of go to the local coffee house. And this was like the heyday of the coffee boom in Europe. And they would discuss like the nuances around the ship, it, you know, who the captain was, like the quality of the ship, the quality of the crew, you know, what kind of voyage they were going on. And like what, what this became is like people would go to this coffee house, try to understand like, should I invest in this ship? Like, is it, is it a good ship to invest in, right? And like this sort of group knowledge, like this gossip became like the first attempt at underwriting, like, like, like a, an actual entity to see if there was any like sort of things that you should know before you try to insure it. And what's really interesting is that this, Edward Lloyd's Coffee House became Lloyd's of London. And Lloyd's of London is like one of the biggest insurance companies on the planet. This all started like that. All right, so then we're moving on. So we have Pascal's tables, right? This is like a mathematical model here that enables people to like create predictive ideas around what risk will and will not happen. And this hadn't existed before. And once this existed, actuarial tables were invented. And people were able to use like basic predictive, like, you know, sort of probability type models here to say like, all right, the likelihood of everyone dying from one thing is very low, but the likelihood of 10% of people dying from this thing is, 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 is higher, right? So you were able to use probability and this help people just underwrite and like it exploded the insurance industry. All right, so then London burns down in 1666. It's a huge problem. 14,000 buildings were, were destroyed and the maritime insurers, the people at the coffee house, were like, whoa, like why didn't we have a mechanism here to like insure against all these houses that were getting burned down, right? So they developed fire and life insurance. So we're just adapting to new risks here, right? In the United States, Ben Franklin, I mean, the coolest American sort of historical figure ever. He's the only not non-president, but he's on the $100 bill. Um, he established com something called the Philadelphia Contribution Ship for the insurance of houses from fire, from loss by fire. What's cool here is that, you know, he was like, all right, we'll insure these houses. We'll insure these buildings as long as you build them according to a newer code. Like maybe mud and rocks are not the building materials you should be using. Maybe you should be using brick or, you know, something else at that time, you know, the more modern materials of that time. And this worked, and this became worked, and this became part of zoning and building code laws that like incentivize better buildings, physical structures, so that they wouldn't burn down. All right, so insurance continues to adapt. We have the Industrial Revolution, we have the automobile, city fires, railways. We come up with disability life insurance, disability products, life insurance products, accident, auto business, and reinsurance. Right, so we've just exploded in sort of the capacity to manage all this risk. Okay, another cool insurance story. So the Industrial Revolution was powered by steam, right? This is just how it happened, right? And steam boilers used to explode. They would just explode all over the place. And that was totally fine. We just accepted that as part of our society. People would die, and they would explode, and we just moved on. And one day, people were like, well, you know what? There's a better way to do this, right? So the Hartford Steam Boiler Company, which is actually still a company today, established, like, this idea of if you engineer better, if you design it better, and you inspect it periodically, we'll actually write insurance against this thing so it doesn't blow up, right? We believe now it will not blow up, so we'll actually financially be on the hook for this thing should it blow up. And what happened? Boilers stopped exploding all over the place, right? So it, it worked. I mean, this is another idea of like insurance kind of like initiating the proper incentives to make things actually get better. 
All right, so, you know, the, insurance, the cyber insurance industry has this sort of like philosophical question, right? Which is like, is cyber risk actually insurable, right? And there's this concept in insurance, which is the made whole doctrine. You get into a car accident, you break your arm, your car's dented, you gotta get fixed, right? You go to the doctor, they fix your arm, you get a new bumper, whatever, you're made whole again, right? But in cyber, like, can you be made whole, right? Like, you have a, a data breach, some PII problems, you know, some PCI problems, you have brand reputation problems, trust problems. I don't know, like nobody really has an answer to this, right? I don't have an answer to this, but you know, this is, a, this is like sort of a, a very important philosophical question for the industry. How can you make a company whole again at, in the event of a cyber incident breach or privacy violation? Or worse. All right, so where are we at today? So the insurance industry today. So these are the three major players, right? And there's more here and there's other sort of nuances around this, but these are the three, the three big uh, whales in the insurance industry. We have brokers, carriers, and reinsurers. So what's a broker, right? So brokers, we've dealt with them, right? Anyone who's ever bought insurance has dealt with a broker. There's sales, all right, they're, they're, they, they broker deals between you, the insured, and a carrier. They're kind of like salespeople, right? Um, they're middlemen between you know, facilitating this deal. And so these are the three big ones, Aon, Marsh, and Willis. There's tons of other brokers. There's middle market brokers, small, medium-sized brokers. There's, a, there's dozens and dozens and dozens of these people. Um, but what they do is they just sell insurance, and they don't hold the risk, they just sell you the policy, right? And what's interesting with them is that they are like moving into information security, like rapidly, right? Like Aon bought Stroh's Freeberg. Stroh's Freeberg is a big incident response firm. These companies are buying InfoSec companies because they want to provide value-added services to you in the event of a cyber incident, right? So they could say, we got a forensics team, we got this team, we got that team, we're gonna load them all up and send them all in, right? So I think that's just interesting from us as practitioners in the InfoSec space that like, you know, insurance people are like coming in here. Um, then we have the carriers. So these are the people that are like on the hook, right? Like financially on the hook. Something happens, you got to like you, you made a claim, they're on the hook, right? So what their goal is to pool, right? They want to diversify risk and pool it all over the place, so that if one thing happens, like the whole company doesn't go down. Like you know, like just diversify, diversify, diversify. So that's what they do, right? And then there's reinsurers, and reinsurers are. Ready? Insurance for insurance companies. So what they do is they buy, if you're a carrier and you think you have too much risk in one accumulated area, like let's just say zip codes in South Florida, hurricanes happen, right? You maybe don't want to have you know, a, a bunch of money sitting in one zip code. What you can do is you can sell that. You can sell that risk to a reinsurer. And again, the goal here is to just pool up and diversify at the highest level you can so that one event can't like take down the entire operation here, right? So these guys are in the cyber game as well, right? So they're, you know, you could sell off cyber risk to them as well. Um, but it's a very interesting kind of, reinsurance is like a little bit of a mind blowing thing for me. All right, so types of insurance companies. This is important because it affects the cyber market a lot. So when you have a standard insurance company or an admitted carrier, that's what it's technically called, you're an admitted carrier. You're actually, all your policies have to go through regulatory approval, right? You gotta write these policies, the regulators, at least in the US, have to read through them and like decide that they're like, you know, for the good of the people, they're you know, financially solvent, they're appropriate, et cetera, et cetera. Right? And so, you know, that's good, right? Your auto insurance, your homeowner's insurance, is all admitted carrier stuff. Unless you're like a really bad driver and like you can't get insurance, right? That's true. You can go into something called the excess lines, right? And the excess lines are typically more unregulated, right? They're still driven by the same carriers that we mentioned before, but it's much more unregulated. And this is where you can get like fancy insurance products. Like let's just say you're a rock star and you want to insure your fingers, right? Or your arm, I don't know, your fingers, right? Um, or your body parts. You can buy body part insurance in this excess market, right? People will sell that to you, right? So if you're, you know, if you have extenuating circumstances, you're buying a non-traditional insurance policy, you'd have to go into this market. Now, yeah, yeah, like I think Marilyn Monroe had a lot of her body parts insured. Um, I'm sure they all do, actually. <laughs> all right, so the, pro the, you know, the thing that's really interesting to me is that a lot of the cyber market, estimated to be 90%, lives in this surplus lines. It's kind of crazy because it's like mostly unregulated then, right? It's just sort of like, you know, people are just writing what they want and there's not a lot of oversight there. Um, all right, so captive. So what's a captive insurance company? 
So let's just say you were, you know, like uh, UPS and FedEx, or you know, maybe you're three big cloud providers, right? And you want to buy cyber insurance or some sort of insurance, but you're, you're finding that the insurance companies are charging you way too much money. And you're like, you know what, we could do this better. We're going to not self-insure, but we're going to form this captive, right? So like the three of us are going to get together and we're going to form this little insurance company that only the three of us are members of. And we're going to basically say, if something happens, like we'll, this insurance company will pay out to one of the three of us based on a condition of terms, right? So like maybe UPS and FedEx have captives around their auto insurance of their trucks. I don't know, I'm just making this up. But it would make sense there, right? That's all that is. So uh, some industries themselves are form, forming their own little cyber insurance captives so that they can make sure that they spread the risk among this industry pretty well. Um, there's direct sellers. Direct sellers is just a company that sells directly, does not use insurance agents and brokers. There's a lot of those in the commercial space. Domestic and alien just has to do with where the insurance company is domiciled. That's a big thing for like regulators. Um, Lloyds of London is super fascinating because it's actually not an insurance company. It's a corporate body that's governed by the Lloyds Act of 1871 and subsequent acts of English Parliament. So it's actually a syndicate, right? That's why they call them Lloyd syndicates, because again, it's like a bunch of, it's many companies that build up into one. And again, just the whole point is diversify risk as much as you can. Mutual companies, you know, these are just owned by uh, policyholders, right? There's a lot of those, like, that's why Liberty Mutual or, you know, State Farm is mutual, right? They're owned by policyholders. And then there's just companies that are owned by the stockholders, right? It's just an organizational thing. All right, so typical commercial insurance, right? So this is like, you know, like what exists like now, like pre-cyber or what had exist pre-cyber. But cyber like touches on a lot of these areas. That's why it's important because they're all kind of growing out of these little specific areas. So, you know, if you're a typical company, you probably have a lot of this insurance, right? You have workers' comp, business owners, commercial auto, whatever, excess insurance in case you have some rare thing, like you want to insure your inventory because it's super valuable. Um, Kidnapping and ransom. So you can buy kidnapping and ransom insurance against your executives. So they probably have it. If you're at a Fortune 100 company, they definitely have it, right? I don't know. I think they would have it. But like, if your executives get kidnapped and held for ransom in some other country, you, know, you have an insurance policy that could go in there and help rescue them and get them out. Usually people don't like to disclose that for obvious reasons, right? Because then somebody would just kidnap you. Um, you could have errors and omission insurance. We went over that. Liability insurance you know, for in case you screw up. Uh, directors and officers insurance, that's liability insurance in case your directors and officers sort of screw up or, or have an issue that causes them to get sued. Product liability, commercial property, crime insurance. So a lot of cyber is coming out of crime, kidnapping and ransom, errors and omissions, and directors and officers. And even product liability, right? If you're shipping IoT devices and you have like, you know, all of a sudden problems with your IoT device, like maybe your product is liable for whatever damaging result happens because of this you know, botnet or something like that. So what happened here? So how did we explode property and casualty into what it is today? So that previous slide almost had no growth for, for dozens of years, just flat, right? There wasn't a lot of exciting thing going on in insurance. But then all of a sudden cyber happens and it's exploded, right? So cyber premiums at this point, 2016, 2017, around $3 billion. They were estimated to grow to like 12 to $20 billion by, by 2020. Some people have revised that number even higher. Um, a lot of the markers are US, a lot of the market is US based. Why is this happening? I don't know. I mean, regulation, news, GDPR, cost, you know, but basically, no industry has been spared of, you know, from like any of this cyber, you know, cyber events happen to everyone, right? So, like, people are just now piling into the market because they want some sort of reasonable coverage around what this looks like. Supply side. So now that's also exploding, right? So now you have all these, the demand side, they want it. And the supply side's like, we're going to give it to you. So this is exploding. 500 carriers are now offering cyber insurance, right? The US in cyber insurance market is dominated by AIG, Chubb, and Lloyd syndicates. And this slide is you know, pulled from the NAIC, which is the sort of federal governing body around insurance. Um, but you sort of see that it's concentrated. Almost 50% of the market is concentrated around three, three companies. All right, so this is a super important concept. If you're ever sitting in a cyber insurance meeting and somebody's like, all right, this is what we're going to cover, having this distinction is, is huge. So first party versus third party. So what does that mean? First party is stuff that happens to you and your company, 
right? Things that you are liable, things that, things that have happened to you. Like you need to, you know, notify people around a breach. You need to provide credit monitoring. You need to launch a PR campaign about how you're going to try harder. You need to compensate the business for lost income. You need to pay a ransom, right? These are things that have happened to you, right? But third party is things that you are liable for. Lawsuits that are coming your way, you know, like, you know, like, you're going to get sued in a class action suit for privacy violations, right? Technology errors and omissions. You get sued for that, right? You've violated an SLA and someone's going to sue you, right? Writing and shipping vulnerable code, right? You might be liable there because it's done something har harmful and people are going to sue you. So it's very important to understand that distinction. Like first party is things that you have to do for yourself and third party is things that are coming and happening to you, things that you're liable for. All right, so language in the cyber insurance world, right? I mean, some of this is self-explanatory, but some of it I was very surprised when I started reading it. So coverage, clear, right? The amount of money that is like, you know, or, or the amount of like what things are coverage, like what specific items are actually covered by this insurance policy. So a typical one is a collection of coverages, right? Limits. Limits are like the financial boundary in which the insurance company will pay. So if you have like a $2 million policy, like that's it. That's the limit, right? You have a $10 million policy, $50 million policy. Those are your limits, right? They will pay no more than that, right? But then sometimes each one of these coverage areas has a sublimit, right? So you might have like a $10 million policy against ransomware, but there's a sublimit under there that is like 25K or 25,000, you know, something smaller, right? And there's a lot of details around here that need to be worked out. This is why traditionally, a lot of lawyers negotiate all these agreements, right? It's like lawyers and lawyers that do this. But, you know, InfoSec is definitely getting more involved in sort of explaining what these things can cover. All right, exclusions. This is a big one. This is a huge one. Exclusions are things that the insurance companies will not pay because they believe that, you know, it's not coverable, right? And there's a lot of really you know, important cases that are going on right now that like are going to test what the limits are. We're going to get into all sorts of exclusions, but these are huge details that need to be paid attention to because these are things that they won't pay for. Premium is the amount of money you pay for the insurance policy per year. Deductible is the amount of money you pay out of pocket if you have a claim. It's kind of the same with like regular consumer insurance. We get what a claim is. And again, just to reinforce that first party versus third party thing, you'll see that in the language of insurance policies a lot. Okay, so what I did here is I took like eight policies and I sort of try to pile them all together to like give you the highlights of like what an average typical cyber insurance policy looks like. It's a very recent one. Uh, this is a smaller one. It's a $2 million limit policy. Um, but this is what a lot of them look like. All right, so coverage area one, incident response. This is first party, right? This is things you have to do to your company to fix this problem, right? You have incident response costs, right? So they have a hotline. You can consult with an incident, cyber incident manager. They'll, they'll, that's a $2 million sublimit. Legal and regulatory costs. So legal advice and defense for regulatory action and fines. That's a $2 million policy. There are some caveats there because at the end of the day, the insurance industry can't be somebody where you can offload like you know, criminal risk to you know, and regulatory risk to. So if you're getting fined by like the SEC, you know, they're not going to like cover this stuff, right? This is like, you know, maybe a PCI fine or some other non-governmental, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't make sense. It would be like morally inappropriate as like a device for transferring risk, right? Um, security and forensics costs, right? You need expert witnesses. You need to contain this thing. You know, you need security consultants, communication costs. You know, you got a media response, brand reputation, put up that website, you know, um, printed mailings, credit monitoring, call centers, and then like, Post remediation, like lessons learned, risk assessments, gap analysis, policies, awareness training, like why did this happen, kind of stuff. You know, but there's like sublimits there. And when you read through this, you're sort of like, okay, well, they're, you know, $50,000 is the most that they'll give you for like post breach remediation costs, right? It's just important to highlight that. All right, so second area, cybercrime. This is again, first party things, things that happen to you. Fund transfer fraud. I mean, this is like, right, one, like who hasn't worked for a company where the fake invoice scam has rolled through, um, you know, somebody fishes a CFO and somebody in that mailbox sends something to a controller saying, hey, pay this invoice urgently, you know, wire it to this bank, do it now. Uh, this happens all the time. Uh, $250,000 sublimit, you know, that's, that's where, so if you, get, if you get fished and your controller wires out $2 million, that's, you know, $250,000 is the most you're going to get here. Uh, theft of funds in escrow, same deal. Theft of personal funds, right? So if a senior officer gets ID thefted or you know whatever, they'll cover that. Extortion. So this is a big one, right? Ransomware, because it was like the biggest deal in the world for two years. 
Um, you know, so a lot of the insurance policies were like, we need to cover this stuff because it's such a, a, such a prominent problem in the industry. So they'll cover that. That obviously has a different sublimit of two million because it's like more marketable. Corporate identity theft, telephone hacking, and phishing. So these are just types of cybercrime coverage areas that exist. All right. Again, coverage area three, system damage and business interruption. This is also first party. These are things that you need to fix, right? So system damage, rectification costs, system business interruption costs, reputational harm, and then loss adjustment costs. So if you're Amazon and your website goes down or everything goes down on Black Friday, that's going to be very costly, right? So you cannot, you know, it's very difficult to insure against what that value would look like. They have really tight sublimits around uh, loss adjustment costs to like sort of recoup that lost revenue that you might have lost while your business was down. All right. Okay, so now we're moving into third party liability, right? So these are things that they cover, you know, things that you're liable for, right? So network security li liability. This is an older one, right? This has been in a lot of policies for a long time. Transmission of malware to third party, part of a DDoS attack, failure to prevent unauthorized access. So if you get sued for those things or you're liable for damage for any of those things, they will cover that. Privacy liability, same deal, pretty self explanatory. You know, a class action lawsuit around, you know, a disclosure of PII or PCI data. Uh, they'll cover that. Management liability, if your cyber directors and officers um, get sued or are part of a class action lawsuit for failure to enact proper security controls or something like that, you know, the, the liability that these individuals would have, you can indemnify them in this insurance policy. Some regulatory fines, we went through that again because, again, you can't offload, like, you know, you can't pay the government here through an insurance policy, but you can pay PCI fines and penalties and assessments. All right, media liability, coverage area number five. Again, this is third party. Libel, slander, disparagement, falsehoods. If you do anything like that, I was wondering what Facebook's media liability defamation policy would look like, but I don't know. Um, yeah. Uh, or if you infringe on intellectual property rights, right? Lawsuits if you are sued for infringing on somebody's intellectual property. All right, you know, so if you're in the technology provider business, you're a a SOC, a managed service, a SaaS company, a cloud company, a whatever. This is an important area for you, right? Because things happen, right? You have SLAs with your customers. You might be in, you know, you might violate some of those SLAs because of downtime, because of something else, you know, and you could get sued or, you know, breach of contract for any of those violations, right? So you could construct a cyber policy where you can make sure that you are insured against those types of lawsuits or, 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 or breach of contract. Uh, suits coming at you. So that's also third party. It's a big area because like you think about something like an AWS. Like, I don't know how you insure that. Like I have no idea how you would insure Azure, AWS, like against like something like this. Like I don't know what insurance company would be like, we're gonna <coughs> we're gonna write that. But court attendance costs, whatever, pretty self explanatory, small sub limit, 10K. But again, if you have to show up in court, they will help cover that. All right, exclusions. This is a good topic, right? So what do they exclude, right? So one of the most common exclusions is property damage, right? So first party property damage, now what is that, right? A cyber attack that causes first party property damages, right? So the best example I could find was the Iranian centrifuges, right? That was a cyber attack, they like stopped working, like they broke, right? So like they were in, they lost these centrifuges, they needed new ones, right? Had they had cyber insurance, I don't think, they, I, I have no idea. They could have maybe they, they would have been excluded. You couldn't make a claim to like repay for my centrifuges because a cyber attack took them out, right? Third party loss. So what, what does that look like? Here's a good story. I think it was in 2001. A uh, water treatment plant had a SCADA radio controlled sewage equipment device, and somebody intercepted radio commands and like intentionally overflowed it, and it spilled out 800,000 liters of raw sewage, killing marine life and making probably a generally unpleasant situation. That's third party. You were impacted. If you lived here, you're a third party to like this mess. You could sue and say like, well, look what you did to my front lawn. There's sewage all over it, right? But it was as a result of a cyber incident, meaning it's excluded. It's complicated, but yeah. It's a bodily injury. So first party loss and bodily injury. So, you know, I mean, I was trying to think of an example. I mean, I guess the best one is you're, somebody locks you in the data center intentionally, and you can't key card out. They like remove your access. I don't know, some sort of cyber attack, internal thing. And they were like, and you're freezing. You develop, bod I don't know, something like that. Something, bodily harm as a result of cyber injury, but you work for that company. Generally, that would be covered by workers' comp, right? That's sort of how that would work. Um, but third party loss. So 
if you, you know, this is a true story. Somebody in Poland was able to take control of a, these trams and loads and like make the train jump off the tracks and it hit the train in front of it. And that train collided. Nobody got hit, nobody got killed. There's some minor bodily injuries. But again, this is excluded. So if somebody launches a cyber attack that causes third party death and destruction, there's no insurance around this. Nobody's gonna write that kind of stuff, at least not right now. Intellectual property, this is a big one. So I Googled secret recipe for Coca-Cola and I found this. Um, I have no idea if it's real or not, but this is an intellectual property that you cannot insure. Uh, because from, you know, if somebody steals your IP from a cyber event, it's too hard to quantify. Like, how do you quantify this? Like, how, if somebody was like, hey, tell me how much it would cost if Coca-Cola secret recipe got out. Like, how do you, I mean, you could take sales for the, you know, a year, times it by a, a million years. I have no idea. It's too hard to quantify. So it's excluded. Now, this is a big one. So in our industry especially. So the hardest problem in our industry, aside from securing applications, is attribution, right? Um, it's hard, right? We, we just sometimes just don't know. We don't have enough data points, right? So what an exclusion that exists is war and terrorism, right? So if a governing body decides that a specific cyber attack was attributable to a nation state and it is considered an act of war, the insurance companies can say, we exclude things that involve nation state actors because we consider them an act of war. And it's not fair for us to have to pay that. So you get some conflicting stuff here. Like Obama said, you know, the North Korea hack in 2014 was not war, but it was cyber vandalism. And then you get Trump saying, not Petya was Russia, right? He's like completely said it. They attributed it to Russia. Other people attributed it to Russia. I, you know, I guess it was Russia. And now this has turned into a big lawsuit. So this company, Mond Oops, sorry. Mondelez, it's like a foods company. I think they own Cadbury and a bunch of other companies. They had a cyber policy from Zurich, and NotPetya affect them, affected them terribly. Like 24,000 servers went down. It was like a huge problem for them. So they were expecting like, their cyber insurance policy to like, actually pay out, and like, they were trying to get, the, you know, it was a $10 million limit. They were trying to get that out of Zurich. And Zurich was like, initially they were like, okay, we'll give it to you. And then they were like, no, we're not going to give it to you. It was an act of war. We don't cover act of wars, right? So they just like said no. And so Mondelez is like, okay, we're going to sue you. And that's where it is now. This just happened like a month ago. So, you know, people in the industry are obviously having opinions about this. So Marsh, which is one of the largest brokers, decided that this is actually not cyber war because for an armed conflict, warlike activity always has casualties or wreckage. And this, nobody died because of not Petya. There was no like bodies in the street, so it's not really war, right? This is complicated. I don't know where this is gonna go. This is in the courts right now, but this is like a watershed case for this industry. Because if Zurich wins, most people's insurance policies just won't work, right? Because like, any government that says it's an act of war, you're just not going to pay. They're not, the, the insurance companies are not going to pay. So it's going to either cause a lot of people to like renegotiate all these exclusions, or like it's just not going to work as a as a as a vehicle for transferring risk, right? So this is an important kind of case here. So look out for it. All right, other exclusions: unlawful data collection. If you're not allowed to collect that data, they can't insure it. If it's actually intentional crime or fraud from the inside, they will not insure it. Failure to enact security, this is a big one. There's a few court cases here, too. So, like, you know, you hear all these stories, like, oh, this XYZ company got hacked. Oh, how'd they get hacked? How'd they get hacked? Well, you know, the firewall was, like, admin, admin. And, like, we just got right in. And, like, that was it, right? I mean, is, I don't know if that's hacking. I guess it's, it's technically hacking. It is hacking. But, like, come on, right? So, like, us are, like, well, dude, why do you have default passwords, right? But, like, in the real world, default passwords exist. So, like, there's cases right now where what is failure to enact security? At what threshold is that, like, totally, like, like actually real versus, like, a default password? Like, obviously, that's failure to enact appropriate security, but it's, it's a little bit murky. So that's, there's a few cases going on about that. Core internet failure, this is a big one too that kind of makes no sense. I mean, it, it makes sense, but like if the core internet infrastructure fails, like GPS satellites or DNS root servers or satellite network, or satellite network or the IP addressing system, I, I always thought like how would the IP addressing system fail? I don't know. It's weird. When you read these policies, they're not necessarily written by Technical people, so I don't know. Um, contractual liability. So if you have a contract between a third-party vendor of yours and you violate that contract because of some cyber event, they won't cover into your contractually liable sort of third-party vendors. All right. 
negotiate. The core here is that all these exclusions can be negotiated. This is why it's important to know that they exist. So if you're ever in this situation, you should just negotiate, negotiate, negotiate. All right, so underwriting. This is another super fascinating topic, right? So how do they get to writing these policies? Like, who are these people? What is their methodology? You know, like, we sit here at InfoSec, and we're like, we know this stuff really well, but how do you know this stuff, right? So this is generally how it works. And I had many conversations with underwriters, and this is kind of like most of what, this is pretty accurate, right? So they have a questionnaire, right? And this is already, like, kind of weird, right? I don't know if anyone's ever seen what these questionnaires look like. It's not a lot of questions. It's, do you have AV, do you have a firewall? Like, it's, it's not that deep. But they ask it anyway, right? I mean, sometimes they're getting better, but, it, you know, I think they need a little bit of, you know, some better questions there. They kind of try to figure out what kind of vertical, what kind of data you're collecting, what industry you're in, you know, what your technological inventory looks like, you know, how many applications, how to use encryption, clouds, IAM, IDM, any controls that you have like IDS, IPS, you know, they ask questions like this. I mean, for the most part, it's not that comprehensive in my opinion. And then if you're large enough, like if this insurance policy is getting really, really big, they're going to bring you in and they're going to say, all right, you're going to meet with a technical team because we don't, you know, we got to really understand what's going on here if you want like a $100 million policy. So they'll meet with the CIO, CTOs to learn more about how the IT program works, corporate governance, blah, blah, blah. They'll try to evaluate financial statements. And they have this correlative idea that if you're financially solvent, you're generally paying attention to your InfoSec program. I mean, it kind of, if you think about it, I mean, if you're not financially solvent, maybe you're definitely not paying attention. There's like a, it, it's like a negative correlation that makes sense to me. I don't know, but th th that's part of it. Uh, third party resources. So there are companies like BitSight Science, Security Scorecard, I'm sure you've heard of them, that try to analyze external risk to a company and try to document that as a risk that's a component. Um, and they have models, right? So they try to do predictive modeling here. And this is hard, right? This is hard. If someone asks you right now, tell me what's going to happen on the internet in six months. It's very hard stuff. So, but this, you know, this, is, this is where they're at right now. All right. So challenges here. Lack of expertise. I mean, this is a big one, right? The insurance industry needs more technical people, I think, to work on this underwriting process. I think the problem with the self-assessment questionnaire is deeply flawed. There should be more you know, controls-based ways of looking at the risk of a company. And I think the, the insurance industry needs this, um, especially like using risk management frameworks. I mean, nobody likes doing risk management framework work, but like, I get it, right? You work for a large enough company, and this is like, you start to get this, right? Um, yeah, expertise. Lack of data. So there's a lot of problems here, right? There's just no data, right? Companies don't want to disclose. It's like, I'm not going to tell you my story. Breaches go unreported. You know, there's a reporting bias. You know, um, some insurers right now, this is why they, they have these hotlines where they say, if you have a breach or you have a suspected breach, they want you to call immediately. And the reason why they want you to do that is so they can get more data, right? They need data so they can really understand how this process works. Um, but again, this is still a challenge. Um, accumulation. So accumulation is like, you know, a sudden aggregation of losses, right? So again, the zip code in Florida analogy, right? If you have, you know, $20 billion written in a specific zip code in Florida, like West Palm Beach or some really fancy area, maybe you don't want that, right? Because if, if a hurricane hits and you have like $80 million mansions that get destroyed, it's going to cost you too much money. So you have to spread that risk around, right? So what does accumulation look like in cyber? This is tough, right? How do you, you can't geographically bound. That doesn't make sense. You can cloud bound, Maybe, right? You could software version bound, like, you know, oh, .NET, 4. Dot whatever versus PHP, whatever versus Django, WordPress. You could maybe spread it out that way. I don't know, but it's a hard, right? And, you know, Lloyd's came out with a study that said a cloud computing failure on a large scale could cause $19 billion in losses. Now, remember, the insurance, the cyber insurance industry is like not even yet 20, this is like wipe the whole thing out. Like, this is, this is, you know, it's a big deal. So, yeah, and, and then there's all these dependencies, like, you know, like if you use like a Salesforce, I don't even know if they're in AWS, but I'm assuming they are, right? So like maybe you don't, like you have SaaS providers that also are accumulated in the same clouds you're using, right? It could also, evolution of risk. So automobiles, they had that all locked up, right? And then things change, right? So you have a self-driving car, and then you have to like figure out how to insure a self-driving car, right? This is, they have to figure this out, right? Because they're going to be on the road soon. Um, so, you know, risk just evolves. But they figured it out in the past. Like, you got to give them some, I think they're going to figure it out, right? I mean, we did steam boilers and ships and, you know, automobiles, and we could figure this out. 
Um, narrow view, so a lot of times right now, there's a lot of narrow views around like PII breaches, because that's been the traditional breach. But there can be a lot of other types of breaches, right? Somebody could just intentionally destroy your data. Somebody could, you know, integrity violations, all sorts of other violations. And there's not a lot of, like, if you were like, hey, I want a policy against, like, you know, integrity or something like that. Like, I don't know if they would really understand exactly how to write that. Um, standardization, there's not a lot of standardization. You read these policies, and there, I'll send, there's a link here. They're publicly available. Some of them are publicly available, the ones that are in the standard lines market. Um, there's not a lot of standardization on this language. You read one to the next, it's like you're speaking a totally different level. So, you know, I mean, there probably should be more, you know, uh, you know work to, like, sort of standardize this language so it makes a lot, a lot more sense. Confusion. I mean, people just aren't even aware of some of the cyber risk and funding them, let, in, let alone the insurance op options that they have. So it just leads to, like, you know, a big confusing mess here. Um, all right. Unclear legal and regulatory rules. Like here, GDPR is a great example of that. Like 4% of revenue, right? That's the fine, right? But like we don't know like how that's going to work out. Like are they really going to do it? Are they not going to do it? Like it's still unclear, right? So there's a lot of unclearness around what that looks like. So how does this relate to AppSec, right? So you, people in the stream are AppSec, right? So what I think is going to happen, and you know, again, this is just me. I don't know. Um, I think that risk management and compliance frameworks are going to become more of this process. I think the standardized questionnaire is going to go out the window, and it's going to be more like, hey, this is a control we want to insure against. Tell me how you, you know, comply with this control, and I want to see some audit around compliance with that control. So if you're running an AppSec program, and, you know, I've been part of this, like, it, it's important to, like, I mean, this is a CIS sort of AppSec I think it's CS control number 18. That's where I pulled this from. And it's just the one that has the most specifics around AppSec. The rest of them are a little soft, right? But like, if you're running an AppSec program, I would take these controls and I would say, all right, you know what? I want to prove and document that I'm doing this at all steps of the way here, right? And I, I just want to do this not just for internal hygiene, but also for the event that like, you know, we need to get some sort of insurance. And then you sort of hand this to an underwriter and it makes a lot more sense to them than just, say, filling out this questionnaire where they might have not enough knowledge. So I just think it's important to get proactive about this and like document an AppSec program so that people in risk management can understand it. Because you go in there and you talk to them about like, oh yeah, you know, we run like continuous, you know, you know, like code scans and then we, you know, do this automated unit testing. Like I don't know if they really understand any of what that means. So I think it's important to like sort of like take what you're doing and like really sort of boil it up to like you know, appropriate like risk level type executives so that, you know, this whole conversation gets easier. Because the second they drop that questionnaire on your desk and they're like, fill it out because we have to go through cyber insurance, you're going to be like, oh man, I wish I had this kind of stuff all documented. All right. So insurance gets it wrong. I mean, this is a true story. Insurance gets it wrong a lot, right? So when has insurance got it really wrong? So Lloyd's of London is a great example. So in the 1980s, they were writing all the workers' comp claims in the United States for Work, workers, workers' compensation, right? And they didn't know, they didn't see, they didn't have an idea, they weren't able to predict that asbestos was in every building material from like 1940 something on, and that everyone started getting lung cancer and had asbestos related illnesses. So Lloyd's of London actually almost went bankrupt. It was actually a big deal. They had to sell their building in London. It was like really, you know, emotionally difficult. But they, I mean, they've since recovered, but you know, these are things where, you know, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't have this in their model. GE long-term care, this is a recent one. GE still has billions of dollars in reinsurance obligations on its books for long-term care. And I think about 10 years ago, it was a big deal in the United States. Like you could buy long-term care insurance if you're in a nursing home. And um, it, it didn't work out so well because the cost of nursing home people were living longer. There was a lot of predictive things that were missed there or maybe they couldn't have been known. But it's sort of a big problem for GE. All right, so this is a really fascinating situation here. This is not, this is something that there's a, this was an article in an insurance magazine about what people want to do to try to disincentivize. And I think a lot of this is about incentives, right? You know, if you can drive, you know, like the controls based kind of thing, like if you can get your application security controls to a place where you can insure against specific controls, you're more incentivized to like actually do that, right? As of this point, like there's not a lot of incentive to like do it aside from the fact that I don't want to get fired, I don't want to be in the newspapers, and like I just want to do a good job, right? But there's not a lot of financial incentive around doing this. So I kind of believe that like insurance could potentially be that incentive. If, if it's built up right, it could be like an incentivizer so that you could actually like use that to like justify a budget or getting better at something or mapping to a specific control, something like that. But this is a little bit, 
of a different kind of insurance, I mean, uh, incentive. So somebody came up with this idea that a catastrophe bond is a specific type of financial instrument that you can buy, and you hold it, and as long as nothing bad happens in whatever bond you bought it for, you get paid on that, right? You know, that's just how it works. And if something bad does happen, they come and collect the money, right? You have to pay the money. So what people were proposing was that if every country had their own catastrophe bonds, cyber catastrophe bonds, and were required, I don't know, maybe by the UN, not required, it's hard for the UN to compel you to do anything, but like you were sort of, you know, this was the model that we all agreed upon, and you sold your cyber bonds, the US sold their cyber catastrophe bonds to Russia, to China, to Iran, to Australia, to every country in the world, right, that would buy it, right? And they would make money off holding this bond, right? But they're also then financially disincentivized to maybe attack you, right? You're holding, if the United States is holding Russian cyber catastrophe bonds, maybe we're not going to like go after Russia because it could cost us a lot of money. I just think that's really interesting. It's not necessarily gone anywhere, but I just think it's like a fascinating way of like sort of handling geopolitical risk around cyber and disincentivizing. I have no idea if this would work, but you know, this is things that people are proposing. All right, partnership. So, you know, a lot of insurance companies are developing partnerships with vendors. This is a big thing. And vendors are like, hey, listen, our insurance companies are like, you use Apple and Cisco, and we're going to give you better rate on your cyber insurance. You know, I don't know. I mean, if you're a CISO or you're a CIO and someone's coming at you, some, some risk lawyer is like, hey, guys, we've got to rip out all our switches and put in these new Cisco switches. You know, that, that, that might be a little bit weird. But this is what's happening, right? So people want to incentivize you to buy these vendor products so that they believe that they're actually more secure. And again, a Cisco switch with a default password is not, I don't know. You know, but Symantec and Travelers have something going on too, right? Like there's a lot of partnerships that are, that are building up right now to sort of incentivize, you know, use of security products so that you can drive down the cost of your insurance policy. I think it's interesting. All right, legal tests. So we talked about the Mondelez case, but this is another one. So P.F. Chang... Um, is fighting with Chubb, right? And this is over a hack that happened where 60,000 credit card numbers were breached from the P.F. Chang um, point of sale service, right? So what happened was is P.F. Chang was using Bank of America as their payment processor, right? Um, so, or their acquiring bank, I'm sorry. Um, and so the courts found that P.F. Chang was contractually obligated to pay Bank of America as a third party lost in the breach as a cyber insurance policy explicitly excluded contractually assumed liability. So that was that exclusion we talked about before. They're contractually liable to like, you know, with Bank of America. That is a, an agreement that they have with Bank of America, right? So Chubb won that argument in saying that our insurance policy didn't have to cover that because you were contractually obligated to like provide a secure environment to ship your data to the, to the BAMS uh, payment processor. So, you know, that was interesting. So that sort of firmed up that exclusion around contractually assumed liability. Um, the next legal test is around the failure to enact security. And this is Columbia Casualty versus Cottage Health. And CNA is a, is a Lloyd syndicate. And what happened here is Cottage Health, you know, had factory default settings. Like, they never patched anything. Like, they didn't do anything, right? And so C the CNA is like, you guys lied on your self-assessment. And like, you didn't even do anything, so we're just going to deny all your claims. And this is like still in the courts right now. Because th at the end of the day, 32,000 me uh, 32, medical records were actually breached. So it's kind of a big deal. So um, more research. So there is a, a I mean, if, if anyone has an interest in this, it's kind of interesting. You can go into this filing access system. You could search out like all the admitted cyber insurance policies that exist today. Like you could just read them, right? It's just, it could be interesting. Um, all the ones that are in the access market, they're not public. You can't actually read them, but you can read these. Um, yeah, that's it. So questions? Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Um, your list of types of. Is it on? Oh, there we go. Thanks, Nikki. So the, um, you listed a bunch of insurance types, um, like the, the primary and the, and the excess line and all those other ones. Yeah. I'm wondering where like government run policy or, or I don't know what the right term is, but like CEA for earthquake, as an earthquake authority in California. Yeah, like insurance. the floods in New York. So where, now, yeah, yeah, so where like you can't FEMA. get coverage through these yeah. types of traditional means, where do the 
state run and federal and or federal runs fit in? Yeah, so I, to the best of my knowledge, they have not gotten into the cyber insurance game where you could government backed cyber insurance policies. They generally help out in areas where even the excess market won't write cover in certain areas because they're geographically too susceptible to a horrible natural disaster, right? So that's when they sort of step in to like sort of like capitalism can't fix it, so we're going to sort of do it ourselves, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, they're not in the cyber game at all at that point. So it's just government backed, sort of like a Sally May and Fannie Mae kind of government backed sort of financial assurance there rather than a company that's backed, yeah. Yeah. Hello. Uh, is there any framework or some set of uh, procedure for filing a claim? Yeah, I mean, it depends by the carrier, right? Uh, you know, there's usually a, a very clear, like when you get onboarded into the policy, there's a very clear mechanism for what a claim looks like. They generally want to hear from you pretty often. So if you think, because again, they want the data. So if you have this like inclination that like, you know, there's been a business email compromise and somebody, you know, might have like, I don't know, done something else, they want to hear from you. So they usually have really clear mechanisms in which you can communicate with them. Some of them even have mobile apps where you can just like click buttons and like communicate with them. So yeah, it depends by the carrier though and depends on how big of an insurance comp uh, a company you are. Yeah, one, one more follow-up question. So you, s you mentioned in one of the slides that uh, the intellectual property is not protected, right? Yeah, generally. So, so what if that uh, information is digitally stored and it becomes uh, part of a ransomware? Yeah. Well, I guess then it wasn't stolen, right? It was encrypted. And presumably, if you pay these ransom, the, you know, pay the ransom, you should be able to potentially get it back. So, yeah, I think I think you're good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> sounds right. Yeah, but again, you, you, carriers would have a lot of opinion on that. But I don't think that would. It wasn't stolen, right? So it's not like you have to deal with the ramifications of what it looked like if it was stolen. You just have to get literally the data back, and maybe a backup, so it doesn't matter, right? Um, so for me, insurance, I always look at it as a transfer of risk, right? I'm willing to accept a certain risk, and for other things to mitigate, I buy something. Do you see an advantage for quantitative risk methodologies versus qualitative in this regard, or doesn't it really matter? Yeah, I, I think any methodology that is more tactical around identifying and quantifying either qualitatively or financially what that risk looks like. Oh, man, my screensaver is pretty great, though. So, um, uh, is 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 not, is missing from the entire space right now. So I, I I don't even know if it would matter at this point. I just think you need better ways of talking about tactical risk when you sort of write these policies instead of just saying like, do you have AV? Like, that is clearly like not enough of a question to ask. You got to dig deeper here. So whether it's a qualitative or quantitative metric, anything would I think would be better. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Hi. Uh, how is companies' reputation um, harm being quantified. I'm surprised that it's covered. Yeah, it's hard, yeah. So, I mean, generally, it's like uh, the cost of remediating um, like the breach and within the public. So, you know, I mean, look at like an Equifax, right? I mean, I don't know, like, if you live in America, like, what really, I mean, maybe we don't like them anymore and we're like, these companies are not, you know, like, we, we want to make fun of them, but like, did they really suffer that much consequential reputational harm? I mean, they're still one of the three credit reporting agencies. Target, I mean, we're still buying, I buy stuff from Target all the time, TJ Maxx, Home Depot. Like, I don't know. I feel like there hasn't been like that one moment in which brand reputation has completely plummeted because of a cyber attack yet. I mean, I don't know. Has anyone heard of any event that like caused like significant? Sony. And the repeated sound. Who has a PlayStation? <laughs> I, I, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. yeah. But I sold mine afterwards, and I refused to buy a Sony product afterwards. All right. Well, maybe if there's more so, people like you, I mean, I was, like, you can start quantifying this. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I just think it hasn't really caused as much impact as we think it will. I mean, nobody wants to go through this, but I think long term, you know, next, you know, over 10, 15 years, people just forget about it. All right, cool. Okay. I hope you guys enjoyed this like deep dive into cyber. Cool. <laughs>